Oh, you ready to go, Max? <laughs> if not, there's not much we can do about yeah, it right true. now. We gotta, we, yeah, that's right, that's right. So, Max, in this lesson, we're going to talk a little bit about personal Bible study, right? We're gonna, that's what we're going to talk about. That's essentially what we're doing. We're, the, the title of the lesson is, is Five Questions on Bible Study. And that's an important topic. That's something that needs to be dealt with, and it needs to be dealt with in our time, I think. You know, if you look at the history of, of Christianity, especially if you focus in on, like, Catholicism, you'll see that there was a time where personal Bible study wasn't valued, uh, very much. As a matter of fact, the Catholic Church said, you know what, you guys don't read the Bible. We'll read the Bible for you. And that's essentially how things were during that time. Uh, but after this time, personal Bible study became sort of a, a desired thing. People wanted to do that after, you, after the Catholic Church moved away from, from sort of mandating what Scripture said. People wanted to study Scripture. Well, that, that's right. And of course, Bible study begins with reading right. the Bible. Uh, the Bible, right now, over 6 billion copies of the Bible have been sold over the years. And it's often said the Bible is the world's bestseller, but it's the least read book. And that really is not true. It is still the most read book on earth. But the world in which we read the Bible today is a world that is changing, and is changing rapidly. Uh, in America, there is a steady rise of skepticism. Atheism is clearly on the rise, and that creates, a, a, Reuben, a cultural atmosphere that is less favorable to people who have faith like yeah. you and I do. I think also this, one of the reasons that uh, there's a problem in, in our culture today is that we've adopted a new reason for living. You know, it used to be most Americans thought, well, there's a heaven, there's a hell, I want to live so that I can go to heaven, so I'm going to read my Bible. But that's not the ultimate measure of good any longer. Mm -hmm. Personal self-fulfillment is the thing. What is it that pleases right. you? What pleases me? And that really has uh, sort of replaced the idea of eternity with God. And so the measure of good now, when it comes to moral authority, yeah. is no longer the Bible. Right. It's what pleases me. Yeah. And yet, in spite of that, the explosive growth of digital Bibles, of virtual, I know every kid here, uh, young kids and old kids too, uh, every kid here has a phone that has a Bible on it. And in fact, most of our phones have uh, half a dozen or more translations. So we've got daily yeah. Bible reading plans. We've got Bible apps. We've got study resources. There are even online communities where you can study the Scripture online. So many things like that. So there's a good side yeah. to what's happening in our culture, even though the culture is becoming more skeptical. Yeah, and you really can see that negative side of, of, of Bible reading sort of, I guess, declining in culture. It's interesting, in my criminal justice, one of my criminal justice classes, in my ethics class, one of the first classes the professor asked, uh, how much of your Bible have you read, essentially? And the professor, he, he sort of put four categories. He said, have you read between zero and 15% of your, of your Bible? Have you read in between 16 and 25% and between 25 or 50% or, or greater than 50? And even though most of the class were or claimed to be Christian or were Christian, most people said, well, I've read in between zero and 15%. Of, of Scripture. So we see that decline in, in Bible reading today. I, I saw a stat on Barna this week. Barna is the organization that does all the surveys and uh, polls about religion in America. And it said that something like 43% of people in America who profess to be Christians seldom or never yeah. read the Bible. Yeah, so right. among some people, uh, Bible reading is just not found. Yeah. So I guess that, that really leads us to our first question, Max. So we were talking about the fact that Bible reading is on the decline. Let's talk about why it's on the decline. Um, and it, I guess my, my reason for why that would be, why Bible reading is on the decline, is because reading as a whole 
is on the decline, especially in America. We're just not a, a reading people in, uh, anymore. We're more of a watching people, aren't we? Well, yeah, you were talking, uh, you and I were talking before the service began tonight, and, you know, the, some of the early communications of mankind was chiseling something on the yeah, wall of it was a cave. The pictures. That's right. And uh, we made these pictures on the walls of the caves, uh, and, okay, we looked at the pictures and we told stories. But now we're kind of turning back to that. I That's mean, right. uh, someone does a Facebook post, and if it has two or three videos, people watch the video. But if there's a long thing you've got to right. read, we slide right yeah. past that because we have become less and less a reading culture. You know what, Max, for the most part, young people aren't, like, young people aren't on Facebook too much anymore. And part of that, I believe, is because their parents are, parents are on Facebook, so they're like, no, we're not going to be on Facebook. Yeah. But they're on Instagram, right? Facebook is a lot about words. Instagram is a lot about pictures. Yeah. And so that, de that definitely teaches us something. But like I said, this is just uh, across the board. We don't read. Any How many Lamar students over there? How many Lamar students? All right, we got a lot of Lamar, Lamar students. How many of y'all read the Code of Conduct? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. There are no hands over there. No, we don't do that. When I was at Lamar, I didn't read the Code of Conduct. I'm sure there are plenty of us here who have credit cards or whatever. How many of us read the terms and service on that credit card to know exactly what we were getting into? We just don't do that. We're not really a reading culture anymore. So I or, suggest that's one or, of or the Or this, answers. Ruben, uh, if you put, install a new piece of software on your computer, it says, I have read. Right. And you're, <laughs> we don't read that. That's exactly right. <laughs> and we just click it and say we've read it because we're, we don't want to mess with it. Yeah. And, and yet we may be committing ourselves to privacy concerns yeah. or privacy uh, openings in our lives exactly. that we really don't want. Maybe exactly. it would be good if we read those, but it might take a lawyer to figure it out. Right, right. And, and there are other reasons why, why, why Bible reading is on the decline. I think some people just don't think Bible reading is necessary, Max. I mean, uh, for, in the religious world today, a lot of what you see, a lot of what you hear is God is love. You know, we're saved by grace, and that, uh, that's true. You know, that's not a false statement, but I think people take that to a place where it's not meant in, in, in Scripture. Well, well, that's right. And you mentioned a little <laughs> while ago that there were some churches in the past that said, we'll read the Bible for you and we'll figure out what it says and we'll tell you what's right. I think some people uh, in today still do that same thing. They trust someone else to tell them mm. what the Bible says. Yeah. And yet, 2 Timothy 2.15, when Paul wrote to young Timothy, he said, study to show, show yourself, yourself approved unto right. God. And so right. it's your personal responsibility to study the Scripture. But I think people have a lot of reasons, Reuben, yeah. why they don't read. Uh, one person said, well, the Bible is just too hard to understand. How would you answer that? If someone says to you, the Bible is too hard to understand, you'd say what? Well, I'd say the, the Bible is, all of the Bible is not hard. There are some very simple things, some very basic things that we can understand. I think of the Ethiopian eunuch in the book of Acts. You know, when the Ethiopi Ethiopian eunuch was taught, uh, he wasn't taught all of the, these deep, difficult things. At least that's not what you would think. Rather, he was taught things that he needed to know to, to gain salvation. Well, that's right. Yeah. Uh, we need to learn simple things first. Uh, right. Reading the Bible is a lot like, or studying the Bible is a lot like studying mathematics. You don't start with uh, calculus or trig. I hope that's uh, not what they do in, in like, yeah, elementary uh, school. Yeah, if you're going to read the Bible, you start with the simple things. You learn those first. And you know, we've got four-year-olds and five-year-olds in these Bible classes in the back. And by the way, our deacons do a great job of managing those Bible classes. But those kids back there are learning things about God and about the Bible. They all know who Abraham is. They know who Sarah and yeah. Isaac and Jacob are. Yeah. Uh, our kids are learning a lot about the Bible. And if you want to learn about Jesus, you know, I can tell you a whole lot about Jesus in about 10 minutes. Right. And so there's a, there's a lot that you can learn that's easy to learn. It's not really that difficult. You know, Max, whenever I was at Kleinwood, I actually did a, sort of a sermon called the 10 minute sermon because they gave me 10 minutes. They're like, you only have 10 minutes. So I was like, okay, 10 minute sermon. And essentially, I just talked about uh, the gospel, uh, the, the gospel message and things that we can learn in 10 minutes. So you're exactly right. And I, just to add on to what you're saying, the Hebrews writer agrees with you. The Hebrews writer sort of condemns the people, you ought to be teachers, but now I have to teach you the simple things. So the Hebrew writer addresses that, that there are some simple things and there are more difficult things. Well, someone says, I don't read the Bible because the Bible is just boring. 
Okay, answer that one. What are you going to say to somebody that says it's boring? Look, there are great stories in Scripture. I think of, I think of the e- Esther, the story of Esther. Esther is a great story with all of this irony. I think the ladies, the ladies' class on Monday, they're going to get into Esther at some point or another. But it's just a great story. This guy who's, who's the enemy of the Jews, he, be, he, he builds these, this, um, this gallows so he can hang, hang his enemy, Mordecai. And then by the end of the book, spoiler alert, he's hanged on the gallows that, that, he, that he himself builds. It's just a great story. Story. You know? What about the book of Genesis, right. what we've been reading? My goodness, how can you call this story of Abraham and Sarah and Hagar and Ishmael and Isaac, how can anyone call that boring? That is I a mean, lot of drama right there. Drama? Right. I mean, this is, <laughs> soap operas on as afternoon TV can't keep up with this story. I mean, twice Abraham has said, hey, no, she's not my wife, she's my sister. I mean, how did, that, how did that conversation go on the way home? That's what I want to know. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's a, and then someone says, well, I don't have time to read the Bible. I know Bible reading is on the decline, but I just don't have time to do it. How would you answer that? Well, the fact of the matter is we make time for what we want to make time for, Mr. Max. I mean, it's, if we had to sort of go and quantify our time, I think most of us would find that we spend a lot of time looking at screens. We spend a lot of time in front of the television or the tablet or whatever, and that time could really be used for something better. That time could be used for, for studying God's Word. So, yeah. Le, you know, let me ask the young people here, and you don't have to answer out loud, but when you wanted to learn how to drive, what did you have to read? Yeah, you got this manual from the state, and you got to learn what these signs mean. You got to r- learn what all the rules and regulations of the road are. And, and why did you learn those? And I'll tell you, you talk about boring reading. That's really boring. But people look at it and say, hey, I want to drive, so I've got to do this. People make time for what they think is important. Yeah, they make time for what they think is important. I, I think the biggest problem is in America is we're so arrogant, we think we already know what's in the book. Mm. And that, I, I think, is one of our problems. Lack of knowledge today has, has never been more extreme than it is right now. Uh, Americans think they know what's in the Bible, but they don't. The, the fact is, the wise read and grow. Fools think they already know. Yeah, that's exactly right. And let me add one more thing to your, to your list of, of, of why this is on the, the decline. It's because people think that it's not relevant to their lives, Mr. Max. And that really leads us to our next question. Question number two. Is, is Bible reading relevant to our lives? I think the answer to that is yes, and we could just go ahead and move on to the next question. What do you yeah, think? Yeah, but we need to talk about <laughs> it, Ruben. All right. All right. Yeah. Uh, if, 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 well, go ahead. Go ahead, Mr. Max. Well, you know, look at the controversies that we have in America today. And uh, again, this is something you and I were sharing. Uh, the, so many issues that we find in America are addressed in the Bible. Yeah. And so modern life Uh, The Bible addresses the issues of modern life like what? That's exactly right. So things like abortion, right? That is sort of indirectly uh, addressed by Scripture. Things like homosexuality and and sort of the definition of marriage. Well, that's developed in Scripture. Uh, uh, Transgenderism and gender, that's indirectly addressed in Scripture. Well, well, sure. And and this morning in, uh, in my lesson in the Bible class hour, uh, have you not read That's right. that God made them in the beginning male and female? That. That's right. Evidently, our culture hasn't read that because we're changing all that up now, trying to make it something yeah. that God did not make it to be. Yeah, so all of these big political debates that are sort of that's in the limelight uh, for our time today, well, these are issues that are found in Scripture. And the thing is, if something's not relevant, then you don't debate about it. You know, I'm sure in the ancient world, they might have had a debate on what's the best way to build chariots. I'm sure that might have been a debate in the ancient world. There might have been books about it. But we don't debate that today because we don't ride around, for the most part, uh, in chariots, you know. So it's just, that's, that's one thing that, that shows that the Bible is relevant to our lives. It's in public debate today. And the Bible contains things. One of the other points I pointed out this morning is that the standard of the Bible is the foundation for everyone's life whether young or old. And so the Bible cuts across every generation. You know, we have people in this room tonight that are in their 80s. We have people that are in the first year of life and and people that are just learning to even say the word Bible or to say the name of God. And so the Bible is relevant to everyone's life. Yeah, you're exactly right. I think of verses like Proverbs 27, 
in verse 7 where it talks about how the rich rules over the poor and the borrower is the slave to the lender. You know, are there rich people today or is that only back then in the past? Well, the real issue in that text has to do with debt. Yes. And, yeah, and exactly. Solomon is saying, guys, stay out of debt because if you get yourself deep in debt, you are going to be a slave. Someone yeah. says, oh, I don't believe that. You know, I can make the minimum payments on my credit cards every month. Yeah, okay. Miss, miss your payments for two months and see what happens. Well, they're they're coming you. after you. Yeah, they're going to let you know you're missing those payments. Yeah, and so the Bible gives you wisdom. In That's fact, right. there's a whole lot in the book of Proverbs and also in Ecclesiastes yeah. and even in the teaching of Jesus about how to address money issues. Yeah. And uh, who's not dealing with money in America? Exactly I mean, right. that's just the way we live. And so the Bible is relevant. I, I think, though, the number one reason why the Bible is relevant today is that we're going to die. Yeah. Hebrews 9, 27, it's appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. And Reuben, recent studies continue to show that 100% of those who make up the human race are going to die. Yeah, I think that's, that's, I think that's a true statement, Max. <laughs> the Bible is the book that gets us ready. You are going to die. Yeah. Someone says, oh, no, not me. Yeah, you too. You will die. You know, 100 years ago, there was a 15-year-old boy who said, I think I'll just live forever. How did well, that work out for him? How, yeah, he, we buried him a long time ago. Right, Everybody's right. going to die. We need to be prepared for death. That's what the Bible is about as much as anything. Yeah. It's like I said this morning in the lesson, uh, we all have that problem in front of us. Death is facing all of us, and we can't fix that problem on our own. That's something that we rely on the Lord for. The Lord has given us the answers, and I think that that's pretty relevant to me. I don't know about you, Max, but that problem is pretty relevant to me. So well, I, uh, definitely yeah, the it. whole issue of sin and redemption, salvation. Uh, that's the basic theme of the Bible. Since we will die, since we will stand before God in judgment, the Bible gets us ready for that. Yeah. I, think the, I think the reason why people say that Scripture isn't relevant is really, it's not because they actually believe that. It's so that they can just do what they want. And I think that's, that sort of gets yeah, to the, I heard the a, heart. I heard a fellow that. years ago on the radio when I was still living in, uh, up in Indiana who said, how can a book that was written 2,000 years ago help you with anything today? Well, he, he evidently doesn't understand the content of the book because every issue of life is addressed here. Whether it's raising your kids, whether it's the kids preparing for marriage, and after marriage, raising and having their own children, uh, building a home, uh, preparing for retirement, all the issues that we face every day in life, the Bible addresses yeah. every one of those things, Reuben. I agree with that. we got to move on, though, Max. Okay, let's go. Yeah. So what are the downsides of not reading a Scripture? You start, Max. What are some of the downsides of not reading Scripture? Well, if the Bible <laughs> is relevant and we don't read Scripture, then we're not going to understand the issues that are really relevant to our lives. We're not going to understand about how to raise our kids. Yeah. Uh, we're not going to understand yeah. about how to, how to treat a wife in marriage. You've yeah. been married how long? Uh, about six months now. Okay. So not, not too long. Not, not, I, don't, I don't have as much time as you have in marriage. Now, well, Lee and I have 55 years of marriage. and We're, we're close. Ruth and I are close to that. Yeah, we're, we're, still learning <laughs> how, we're still learning how to apply the Scripture to our lives. Yeah. And, yeah. and someone says, well, seems like to me you'd have it figured out by now. Listen, life itself <laughs> is a learning experience, and the Bible is our guidebook to teach us as we journey down life's road yeah. together. And so if the Bible is relevant to marriage, relevant to raising kids, relevant to being grandparents, yeah. uh, Lee and I right now have four grandkids, and last week we added, oh, now we have six. We had two more last week. Right. Uh, not babies born, but... Uh, our adoption. daughter Jennifer adopted two boys and it went through the court over in Bulgaria yeah. and in just a few weeks they'll be here in the United States but the Bible tells us how to even be grandparents yeah. the Bible is relevant in that regard yeah. the Bible addresses money matters it addresses yeah. death and judgment and if we don't read the Bible we are going to be uninformed yeah. about these relevant things in life you know, the way I see it, Max, we, we essentially have two choices. We can either choose to, to follow our own wisdom or follow the wisdom that God has set out for us. And it seems like throughout Scripture, when people just follow their own wisdom, uh, it didn't work out too well for them. You know, I think of Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 3. Well, really in Genesis chapter 2, God tells Adam and Eve, hey, look, 
I don't want you to eat from this tree. You can eat from any other tree. You're free to eat from any other tree except for this one tree. But then in Genesis chapter 3, it says how it talks about how the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes. So from her point of view, by her wisdom, looking through her eyes, the tree was good. But the problem is she shouldn't have been looking through her eyes. She shouldn't have been relying on her own wisdom. She should have been relying on God's wisdom. So whenever we rely on our own wisdom, that just causes a lot of trouble. And the thing is, we see that throughout Scripture. We see it in Genesis chapter 6 where it talks about the daughters or the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful. Uh, We see that with Samson and and his and the the women that he he got with and he saw that these women were beautiful and David too you know with uh, Bathsheba or you want to see someone who trusted their own wisdom what about king Saul that's right there's a guy who made a mess of his own life and made a mess of the nation of Israel at that time yeah. because they trusted in their own wisdom the bible contains the wisdom of god and that's what right. we need in life that's our guide you know examples like that examples like Saul David Adam and Eve That teaches us that evil things can look good to us at times. And that needs to be a scary thought for us. The fact that evil things can look good to us. And that should teach us not to rely on our wisdom, but rather to rely on God's wisdom. Okay, so we see some of the downside. Let's look at the upside of reading Scripture. Yeah, I think some of the upsides of reading Scripture is, is we get to learn from other people's success and other people's mistakes. You know, we don't have to live life the hard way, sort of making the same mistakes that everyone else has made. Uh, We don't have to make a million mistakes just so that just so we can find the right path. You know, I think it's crazy how we tell inexperienced people, people who are just starting out there in their lives. Hey, you know, you just need to live and learn. Uh, Just, you know, make your own mistakes and, and you will figure it out. Let's turn that around. Instead of live and learn, how about learn and live? Yeah. Let's learn from the mistakes of other people. Uh, it's often said experience is the best teacher. I'm not so sure that's right. Yeah. Experience may be the most expensive teacher right. that you will ever have. Right. And is it true that I should learn from my mistakes? I should. But I would rather learn from the other guy's mistakes. Exactly right. And so when I study in 1 Samuel chapter 15, the life of King Saul, and I see this guy making one mistake after another, after another, I'm thinking, okay, I don't want to repeat what he did. Right. There's a passage in Proverbs 13, 15 that says, understanding, good understanding gives favor, but the way of transgressors is hard. Okay. There's something to be learned there. When you see the difficulties that transgressors in the Bible got themselves into, like King Saul or like Judge Samson or like Adam and Eve, you see the messes they got themselves into. I don't want to repeat that. The way of transgressors is hard. And, and you know, we seem to apply that logic, that live and learn logic, only to moral issues. We don't really apply it to other areas of our life. You know, I think of the example of back in 1903, the Wright brothers. They, they successfully flew the first airplane. But you know, before they successfully flew that first airplane, uh, there were a lot of mistakes. I wouldn't, have wanted, I wouldn't have wanted to be on one of those airplanes, one of the beta airplanes that they were trying out. There were a lot of mistakes. There were a lot of airplanes that did not work. But you know what? Whenever we build airplanes today, we don't have to go back to 1903 and make the same exact state mistakes that the Wright brothers made. We learn from the people in our past, and we just build on what history has taught us. Well, that's right. Uh, And so when we study in the Scripture and see the failures, you know, the Bible is a book of balance. It shows us a lot of cases of failure, but it shows us a lot of cases of success. And we ought to imitate the successes and avoid the failures. That's just common sense. But still, people say, well, I want to learn for myself. I want to make my own mistakes. When you want to fly from here to, to L.A., you don't build an airplane for yourself and say, I want to learn about this myself. Yeah, you, you, you work on the, you operate on the basis of what others have already yeah, done. That's exactly right. Another upside is, is we know things for sure. We know for sure what God wants from us. Because some people, you know, I was, uh, I was scrolling through Facebook one day, like, like you were talking about, and I saw someone make this comment, and they said something along the lines of, I wish God would just sit next to me and tell me what he wants from me. Like they were unsure of like, I, I want God just to tell me for sure what he wants from me. But the thing is, if we study scripture, we know what God wants from us, don't yeah. we? And what, what would God say if he was sitting next to you and telling you what to do? He would say, fear me and keep my commandments. That's exactly okay, right. that's in the Bible already, isn't it? That's exactly but right. 
people say, well, and, and, you know, I think part of the reason there is that people say, well, I want to be something special. I want God to speak personally to me. I don't want to have to open a book and read something and draw a conclusion. That's, I guess we're trying to take the short way home. I don't know. Yeah, and just one more uh, before we move on. Uh, the upside of reading Scripture is eternity. We know what God wants from us, sort of what I said this morning. We know exactly what we need to do to please the Lord. All right, All right. we All do right. need to move on to this last okay. one here. This question five, how can we do this better? We're talking about Bible reading. What can we do to enhance our own reading skills and uh, maybe do a better job in, in reading and learning? What can we do? Well, one of the things that I think we can do is just have an accountability partner on that. Uh, maybe, maybe, you know, have your wife say, you know, we didn't read today. Have your wife remind you about that or a friend, you know, hey, text you. Hey, did you, did you read your scripture today? Or maybe do something with a Facebook group. There are a lot of things that we could do to sort of create this accountability that we see it's important in scripture and we can apply that to our Bible reading. You know, there are two or three brothers here in the congregation that uh, I'm liable to get a verse from them and it'll be, a, here's a verse for today, something to think about. That's one way you can yeah. encourage. Of course, it's only one verse. Uh, I asked my wife almost every morning, have you read your Bible today? She said, yes, I read it an hour ago or whatever. Uh, the idea of accountability to another person. Yeah, that's you good. read your Bible every day? I do. Well, I mean, yes, I do. Okay, great. <laughs> right. I put you on the spot. No, I, I think another thing that will help us along with the accountability is, is a schedule. I think schedules help uh, for certain people where they have a set time where they're, they're like, all right, I'm going to read. I'm going to read my Bible at this time every day. Well, the, the problem is if we don't schedule a time to do it, we get in, involved in the affairs of the day and, okay, as soon as I finish this, I've got to do that, one thing and another. When our kids were young, we would meet at the breakfast table every, every morning at 7 a.m., 7 o'clock, and we would do a Bible reading and discuss the reading. It may only be three to five or six minutes, something like that, yeah. but it was something that we did every morning, and we did it for many, many years. Uh, I read the Bible when I first get up in the morning. That's my first activity, and it's easier for me to do that because uh, it's early, early, and no one's calling. I've not got any text yet or anything like that, and the events of the day haven't got started yet. So starting off with reading is good for me. I know that some of the folks here, though, Reuben, they read the Bible at night when they go to bed. Yeah, and that works for some and people. And I remember talking to one of our deacons and his wife. They said, that when they would retire for the evening, they would sit in bed and read the Bible together. He would read, she would read. That's a great thing. Yeah. However you do it, figure out your own way of doing it. Right. Another thing about the Bible reading I think that is really valuable is to read from different translations. I use about four translations. I read from the New American, from the New King James, the ESV, the English yeah. Standard Version. Also sometimes read from the uh, Christian Standard Bible. And it's interesting that sometimes there'll be a nuance in the reading in one translation that I won't see in the other. So it really it helps, helps my understand. understanding. Yeah, yeah. It helps you understand. And uh, just another thing that could help us, and I mentioned this earlier, but it's quantifying our time. Sometimes we just think we, we are so much busier than we really are. And really, if we just quantify our time and sort of lay out, this is what I'm doing, we'll realize we've got more time than we think we do. Well, once again, we make time. For what's really That's important. Exactly right. So uh, I think the idea of the accountability yeah. partner is good. Yeah. Checking up on one another. Yeah. Maybe someone will uh, set up a Facebook page for our reading. Right now, this week, we are reading chapter 21 yeah. of the book of Genesis. By the way, next Sunday night, Brother David and I will address the last four chapters uh, I guess that's 18, 19, 20, and 21. We'll do our text talk next Sunday night. But we really want to urge everyone to do Bible reading. This, uh, and, I, and I think we have really accomplished a lot in this regard. We have become a Bible reading church, and yeah, that's a good thing. That is a good thing. Bible reading church, we ought to be that. We ought to be a praying church. Yeah. Those two things will make a difference in the life of this congregation and in our lives individually, Reuben. And, and this is important because... As Christians, we should always be growing and maturing. You know, in 1 Thessalonians, Paul tells the Christians, you know, you've, you've done what I've been telling you, but I want you to excel still more. So there is a sense in which we're always growing and we're always excelling. And that's the attitude we should have um, so that we can be ready for eternity in which we will we, we'll be sort of transformed truly into to the image of Christ. Right. 
And that's the, that ultimately is the purpose, yeah. is to take us into eternity, but in this life is to be like Jesus. Right. Conform to the image of God's Son. That's Romans 8, yeah. verse 29. Final word? I've got nothing else. Got nothing else. Got well, nothing else. I, I ran across a quote, and it's a quote you may have seen before, but I, I prepped this on the slide this evening. Uh, that is that the Bible contains the mind of God. People want to know, what is God's will? What, what does God say about this? What does God think about this? Well, this is the book we go to. It contains the mind of God. You not only learn about God, but it says the Bible contains the state of man. You learn about yourself. You learn what your, de what your circumstance is and what your destiny is before God. You learn about the way of salvation. You learn about the doom of sinners, the happiness of believers. The doctrines of the Bible are holy. That is, they've come from God. They're something special. Its precepts are binding. That is, what God has commanded for us in His Word, we ought to keep those things. And its histories are true. Right now we're reading the history of Abraham and Sarah and Isaac and Jacob. Its histories are true. And then finally, its decisions are immutable. That word immutable means unchangeable. I don't know who wrote this little, this little short paragraph, but it's one that really contains truth and it grasps the substance of the Bible itself. If you've been looking at the Bible and realize that your state before God is not what it ought to be, you have the opportunity right now, right here, to make yourself right with God. If you believe in Jesus, that He is truly the Christ, the Son of God, then you need to give your heart and life to Him. Obey Him in faith, repentance, and baptism, and He will provide blessing for you and help, and help you prepare for eternity. If you would do that, we invite you to come now as we stand and sing. Come now.